Tonight, Fortress Ottawa, heightened security in the countdown to Joe Biden's historic visit. The prelude to a pivotal face-to-face -face with the U.S. president. How we can and will be working together. With the crossings at Roxham Road on the radar. The United States is open to a conversation. The cause of a capsized ship that claimed six Canadian lives. How many children are going to lose their dads? Like, where does this stop? Disasters at sea and renewed demands for accountability. Plus, a symphony of clues on the life of Beethoven. The ailing health of one of history's greatest composers. What the DNA reveals. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Reporting tonight from Ottawa. Good evening, everyone. We begin tonight with breaking news. The backbench MP who's been front and center in the Chinese interference allegations is no longer part of the Liberal caucus. I have informed the Prime Minister and the leadership of the Liberal Party caucus that I will be sitting as an independent Global News reported today Han Dong secretly advised a Chinese diplomat in 2021 to delay the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. At the time, they had been detained in China for more than two years. Global News also reported Dong got a boost from Beijing to win his Toronto riding. He denies all allegations. To my wife, Sophie, and my kids, I love you. I thank you for all the support and love you give me. The truth will protect us. Our honor and our family will get through this together. Sorry about that. Thank you, Speaker. A discussion on China is on the agenda for Joe Biden's first visit to Canada tomorrow as U.S. president. A short flight for a long-awaited trip. And parts of the nation's capital will be transformed into a no-go zone. Our coverage begins tonight with Ottawa Bureau Chief Joyce Napier. A presidential visit in any city means high security, and it will take over the area around Parliament Hill and wherever the president goes as stars and stripes line the streets and barricades are being placed strategically to control crowd movements. Any presidential visit is a very large event. It requires extensive planning. Uh, it requires that uh, a lot of agencies work in a collaborative uh, manner. The RCMP, the Canadian military, the U.S. Secret Service, working with the Ottawa and Provincial Police, while National Defence confirmed it will be providing air security during the visit of the President and the First Lady, Jill Biden. The city core, once occupied by the trucker convoy, will practically be in lockdown come Friday. Always a great moment when we have the opportunity to show off Ottawa as the capital of Canada. But Joe Biden's visit will also showcase a long, even if at times, turbulent relationship. We are aligned on our goals and our values, and we work together to figure out what works for both of our citizens and both of our countries. Joe Biden has Trudeau on speed dial, but there are irritants and hurdles in the relationship, including trade issues, Canada's military shortcomings, and the safe third country agreement that is seeing tens of thousands of asylum seekers cross the border into Canada. The prime minister is hoping to renegotiate it. He's now even saying he can't protect our borders against illegal border crossing without the permission of the United States president. Pierre Poilievre will have a brief meeting with the president. And another local, Grant Hooker, is hoping Biden will add an impromptu visit to his local business. Just like Barack Obama did on his first visit to the Capitol. I'm hoping that President Obama said, Joe, if you come to Ottawa, you got to get down to the market and have a beaver tail. The President and First Lady will be in Canada for a little over 24 hours. Tomorrow evening, they will have a more intimate dinner with the Prime Minister and his wife, Sophie Grégoire Trudeau, at Rideau Gate. Uh, but Friday will be the big day with more formal meetings and an address to Parliament. Omar? And it all starts tomorrow. All right, Joyce, thank you. And let's bring in CTV's Richard Madden, who was at the White House briefing today. Richard, what more did we learn about Biden's visit? Yeah, Omar, the White House confirms to us tonight that thorny issue of irregular migration affecting directions on both sides of the border 
will be on the agenda. Specifically, a loophole in that safe third country agreement signed nearly 20 years ago. That allows migrants to claim asylum at irregular crossings, for example, a road leading into Quebec, instead of the first safe country they arrive in, like the U.S. I asked the President's National Security Council spokesperson what possible actions the administration is considering. The safe third party agreement, a loophole in it, is what's causing many migrants to land from, go from the United States into Canada. Is there any discussion about modernizing it or scrapping it? I don't want to get too far ahead of, uh, of the agenda. I, I think you know we'll have more to say uh, once we get up uh, to Ottawa, and of course the President will have a chance to talk to you all uh, when the meeting's over. Issues of migration. We are well aware of Canadian concerns. We have concerns of our own. Uh, and, uh, I mean, it's a shared hemispheric, a shared regional challenge. So I, I have no doubt that they'll discuss it. And Admiral Kirby will be traveling with the President, the First Lady, and Secretary of State. Air Force One departs tomorrow afternoon, and I'm told staffers were advised to pack a heavy sweater for their trip north. Oh my. And an umbrella. It's expected to rain all day tomorrow. All right, Richard, thank you. That forecast is cold comfort for asylum seekers who cross into Canada along a rural road that's become a political flashpoint. Here's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. Four, zero. Record traffic at Roxham Road now spells booming business for some cab drivers in upstate New York. More than 100 migrants a day make their way here, anxious to step foot into Canada. Some have called on Ottawa to shut down Roxham to force migrants to go through regular channels. But Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's not that simple and says modernizing the safe third country agreement between the U.S. and Canada is the way to go. These are things to be taken seriously. We've been working very closely with the Americans for many months and uh, we hope to have announcements soon. Roxham was once just a quiet dead-end road straddling the U.S.-Canada border. It grabbed international attention in 2017. You have a passport? Yes. Put on the map by fears of deportation under the Trump administration. Lady Pintra once worked for the government in Haiti. She fled after escaping armed men and eventually began a journey across several countries with her eight-year-old son, at times hiding in a container or crawling under barbed wire. She heard of Roxham Road at a church in Florida. Canada. When she crossed in 2018, she was entering her dream country, she says, and now she works as a nurse's aide. While the focus here has been on the number of people heading north, there's also the reverse trend that's building, a large increase in the number of people heading south, and that's proving to be a far more treacherous journey. A migrant died of hypothermia taking this path here in January. There was a large number of people picked up. And U.S. Border Patrol reports 10 times more traffic on this stretch than last year. Some disenchanted with their life in Canada. Still, you have problems of people waiting for their working permit since eight months, nine months. That in a country, say advocates, struggling with a labor shortage. And they say Canada and the U.S. have to find a way forward as conflicts, climate catastrophes will continue to drive up the number of migrants in search of a safe haven. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Saint-Bernard de la Colle, Quebec. Canada's ambassador to the U.S. said today the Americans have not dismissed the idea of reopening the safe third country agreement. This evening, I sat down with a U.S. ambassador to Canada and asked David Cohen if that was true. In answer to your direct question, the United States is open to a conversation about dealing with all of the causes and issues of irregular migration, um, and that can include the safe third country act. So is the renegotiation of that pact currently underway? So it's, I, I don't, it's not, it, by the way, it's not, what's even being talked about isn't renegotiation of the, of the pact, the, the, the subject of the conversation, uh, the conversations are around an annex to the agreement itself. And that's, they've been ongoing for, for, they've been ongoing for a long time. So if there are currently talks underway for an annex or an addendum to the agreement, what, what does that look like? So I, I want to be careful. I don't want to preempt the president and the prime minister. This is their meeting. Despite what people might think, these meetings and conversations are actually dynamic. They're not scripted in advance um, so that someone like me can tell you, well, this is exactly what's going to happen. Do you anticipate that after this two-day visit by President Biden that there will be some kind of deliverable 
on this specific point? So, um, I, again, I, I don't want to predict what happens as a result of it. It's just not, it's just not appropriate for me to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the fifth on that question for now. And we covered much more ground with Ambassador Cohen. The full conversation is at ctvnews.ca. And for the first time ever, Canada's population grew by more than a million people in a 12-month period. So almost 40 million people now call this country home. CTV's Heather Wright on what's behind the boom. Canada's population grew at the highest rate in nearly 70 years, a rate that, if maintained, would double the size of the country by 2050. This year I'm trying to find a job. One of those newcomers is Mohammed Akbar Safi, who immigrated to Ottawa last March. He's working on his English and raising his family, but is struggling with the high cost of rent. The most problem for refugees, this is housing, but hopefully for the future we will try to afford this. The federal government has a plan to welcome 500,000 immigrants per year by 2025, but housing is not keeping pace. A report last month from Desjardins says new home building needs to increase by at least 50 percent through next year to meet demand. Affordable housing and housing more broadly uh, will become a bottleneck one day to Canada's economic growth. Today, Immigration Minister Sean Fraser acknowledged the challenges newcomers face with finding an affordable place to live and says the government is working to bring in more skilled workers to address the labor shortage in the construction industry. We can actually help use immigration to mitigate against these challenges rather than exacerbate them. A pilot program is also encouraging skilled newcomers to live and work outside the big cities where rent and home prices are the highest. Timmins, Ontario is one of those places where the city's population has been declining for decades. When the most recent StatsCan uh, data came out, you know, we're all a little um, shocked and disappointed to see that, that yet again the population had declined. Uh, and so we've really been turning to immigration as a solution to, to try to meet some of the, the needs. But keeping those people can also be a challenge for both small communities and big cities, as the high cost of living could drive immigrants to look elsewhere. Omar still vulnerable in their new country. Okay, Heather, thank you. And for so-called ISIS brides and children trapped in a Syrian detention camp, there are signs tonight for the Canadians. Repatriation is imminent. CTV's Judy Trin explains. Very, very sick. I don't believe he will be able to survive without me. A desperate message from a mother in a detention camp in northeast Syria. She's not Canadian, but her three children are. Their father from Ottawa may have died in a prison for ISIS fighters. Canada wants to help the children, but not her. The ask, however, was that they be, the children be repatriated without their mother, and so the mothers would then be marooned in northeast Syria. Any day now, a plane will arrive to extract 26 Canadian women and children. These lawyers have applied for temporary resident permits for two foreign-born women, Asiya and Zara, to get them on that flight. Medical documents show Asiya's oldest son has severe autism and epilepsy. The other son burns that won't heal. Zara's children suffer from intestinal parasites and an eye condition that could lead to blindness. This Toronto doctor verified the medical reports. You do not need to be a doctor to know that it would be cruel and heartless to separate such young and seriously ill children from their parents. In their files, Asiya says her husband was a scholar studying the Islamic State, while Zara says she was a victim of human trafficking. But some terrorism experts caution against helping the women whose stories have not been verified. What responsibility does Canada have to non-Canadian citizens who are in Syria? I think the answer is we don't have a responsibility. The Foreign Affairs Minister has repeatedly deflected when questioned about bringing back non-Canadian mothers. For me, what is really important is that these children come back here. Along with the non-Canadian mothers, the fate of four Canadian men with unproven ISIS ties also remains in limbo, while the federal government appeals a court order to repatriate them. Omar. All right, Judy, thanks. When we come back... Obviously, recommendations are not working. Demanding change after a fatal sinking in the Bay of Fundy. Plus... A crescendo of clues on the health of Beethoven, thanks to DNA.
An investigation has now answered the question of why a boat went down in the Bay of Fundy in 2020, killing all six crew members. But still tonight, there are painful what-ifs. CTV's Atlantic Bureau Chief Chris Anajkate reports. So this is the boat. After more than two years, the families of six fishermen who lost their lives on the Chief William Solace have more questions than answers. How many mothers are going to lose their children? How many wives are going to lose their husbands? Lori Phillips' son, Aaron Cogswell, was on the boat bringing home a heavy load of scallops. An investigation has found that it likely capsized in fierce waves, with water unable to drain because the freeing ports were covered. The Chief William Solace, like many other fishing vessels, did not have a formal stability assessment in place, so the crew made operating decisions that likely affected the vessel's stability. The Transportation Safety Board has been pushing for that stability test for all small fishing vessels since 2015, after the Caledonian capsized in BC. We consider that Transport Canada's response to this specific recommendation is unsatisfactory. This A-frame was installed on the William Solace before a requirement for a stability assessment on modified vessels. On average, about 11 fishermen lose their lives a year, with most fatalities preventable. The ongoing lack of regulatory oversight means that fishing crews are routine, routinely operating on vessels without even knowing how to stay safe. The fact that it is not being done across Canada yet is very frustrating. These two boys are without a father. Dan Forbes was just trying to make some money before Christmas. His widow wants to see action. A lot of recommendations were put out as far back as 2015 and still have not been taken care of. As for Lori, this makeshift memorial keeps her going, but moving on hasn't been easy. I haven't dealt with the reality really yet. I mean, my son lived with me. His bedroom's still in place. His clothes are still hanging in his closet. Transportation Minister Omar Al-Gabra was not available for an interview today, but in a statement he said that he would thoroughly review and respond to the report in less than 90 days. Chris Najkate, CTV News, Halifax. Tempers flared in Newfoundland today when furious crab fishermen took their fight to increase quotas to the provincial legislature. Order, please. It's obviously... After being kicked out of the House, the protesters confronted the provincial fisheries minister in the lobby. I'm just one fella. I'll come get you, buddy. I'll tell you right now. You lock me up if you want. And another kind of storm in a suburb of Los Angeles, which was hit by a possible tornado today. It touched down this afternoon, a rare sight this time of year. Roofs were ripped off buildings and at least one person I was, was in injured. The classroom and we just heard like a lot of wind, I guess. It's the second twister to hit the region in the past day. Still ahead, a close encounter with a pair of orcas. The stunning and surprising display in BC. Classes resumed today at the Halifax Area High School, where two staff members were stabbed Monday morning. And today's lesson began with a blunt message for the government, do more to make schools safer. Just before the opening bell, a dozen teachers posed in silence, displaying the universal hand gesture for distress. I spent three hours with the staff yesterday. The emotions in that room uh, and, and the fear um, and the, the wanting to support, be there to support their students was paramount. They need some help. The teachers are calling for a reversal on recent staffing cuts and better access to mental health supports for students. And in London tonight, former British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is facing a formal reprimand for misleading Parliament over the Partygate scandal, hosting parties during the pandemic. I am here to say to you, hand on heart, that I did not lie to the House. When those statements were made, they were made in good faith and on the basis of what I honestly knew and believed at the time. If the committee concludes he lied, Johnson could face suspension or be ousted as an MP. In British Columbia, onlookers were treated to a surprise visit from a pair of killer whales. 
The orcas breached the ocean surface at a popular pier in Victoria. Today's spectacle follows a weekend sighting of a killer whale pod swimming alongside a BC Ferries vessel. Passengers watched from the top deck as the six whales made a splash. A true gift of nature. And after the break, unlocking the secrets of a man who's left behind an enduring musical gift. We end tonight on a crescendo to an intriguing mystery about a composer widely regarded as the greatest who ever lived. Here's Paul Workman. It's well known that Beethoven struggled with his health, who made beautiful music even as he was going deaf. Yet the cause of his suffering has long puzzled both the scientific and music worlds, evolving into something of a great Beethoven myth. In our imagination, says archivist Julia Rong, we believe he could only have created such wonderful music because he was ill. Precious locks of Beethoven's hair have now solved at least half the mystery, yielding up the great composer's genome sequence. Nicholas Rojewski is both a musician and scientist. It's not so simple to get a sequence from pieces of hair that have been spread around the world, he says. It is almost certainly Beethoven. It turns out Beethoven was genetically predisposed to liver disease. That, combined with hepatitis B and steady drinking, killed him at the age of 56. In the spring of 1825, he describes spitting a great deal of blood from his windpipe. This is likely indicative of cirrhosis, so the, the further progression of this liver disease. The big disappointment is what they didn't find, a genetic link to his deafness, probably caused by a middle ear condition. We know what triggered the liver disease, says the study's co-author, but not what caused the hearing loss. Yet there was a surprise in all of this genetic stalking. Beethoven's DNA and that of his living relatives didn't match, suggesting an extramarital wing of the family that has suddenly come to light. Paul Workman, CTV News, London. A whole new layer. That's a snapshot of this Wednesday from Ottawa. We'll be right back here tomorrow night with extensive coverage of the U.S. President's visit to Canada. Thanks for watching. Good night.